turn our attention to the word of God. Uh, if you could turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, and we're going to be reading uh, from verse 8 to verse 17. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 17. Praise God. And when you found it, you can say amen. Praise the Lord. I think I heard three people say amen. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 17, and it reads as follows. And in Lystra, a certain, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Uh, then the priest of Zeus, whose name was in front of the, their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Let the people of God say amen. amen. I'd like to speak to you today uh, to the title, Tell the True Story. Tell the True Story. And we would like to just uh, think on three themes today uh, under that title. And the first one is a great miracle. The second theme is Who's the hero? Who's the hero? And the third one is, it's all God. It's all God. Praise the Lord. And so uh, we're looking at the book of Acts. Uh, many of you know a whole lot about the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, in the last four weeks, we've been studying the book of Acts uh, in Bible study. Uh, but just uh, to give you a summary of the book of Acts, of course, the uh, author, the human author writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, is Luke. Yes, the same Luke. Uh, that is the human author of the gospel, according to Luke. Uh, Luke actually accompanied Paul on many of his uh, missionary trips. Uh, Luke is known as uh, Luke the physician, but he's also known as a historian as well. Uh, and so the book of Acts is written somewhere, somewhere around, now a lot of scholars, they have disputes about this, but it's written sometime around 61 AD. Uh, a lot of scholars place it at, and it's written to a person by the name of Theophilus. And there's not much known about Theophilus, who Theophilus was, but people know him uh, basically as somebody that was a prominent person. He had a prominent role, prominent position, and he was asking questions about the gospel and wanted some more information. And so Paul began, not Paul, but Luke began uh, to write uh, about the gospel in Luke uh, to Theophilus. Um, Luke describes himself as someone that had perfect or complete understanding of these things. And so Luke is now writing to a Theophilus uh, just so that he would know the certainties of these things that have uh, transpired. And so as you look throughout the book of, of Acts, you see that it shows the history of uh, Christianity, the history of the gospel. Um, the Gospel of Luke, of course, it shows uh, the acts of Christ and the things that Christ did. But as you move now into the book of Acts, it shows uh, what transpired 
after the ascension of Christ. After the ascension of Christ, uh, the spread of the gospel, uh, we know, I believe it's in the eighth verse of the first chapter, uh, it says the disciples were asking Christ and they were saying, well, when are you going to restore the kingdom of God uh, to Israel? When are you going to bring restoration? And Christ said, it's not for you to know, uh, but he said that you shall receive what? Power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be what? Thank you. Witnesses. Uh, and uh, witnesses where? In Jerusalem, uh, in Judea, in Samaria, uh, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And as you look at the book of Acts, it actually sets out the outline in that order. But what we see in the book of Acts is that uh, the church, in addition to spreading the gospel, they endured so much persecution. How many know that when you're doing God's business, the enemy is going to try to fight you? Amen. When you're doing something for the Lord, the enemy will try to fight you. It's something that you have to just be prepared for. You have to be prepared for battle. You can't be afraid of it, but you have to be prepared for it. And so as they began to evangelize and talk about the resurrection of Christ, uh, there was uh, persecution, uh, persecution by someone by the name of Saul. His name was Saul at that time. And Saul was uh, bringing people into prisons and getting letters against them so that they could be put to death, consenting unto the death of, of Stephen, of course. And as we uh, go forward in the book of Acts, we see somewhere in about the ninth chapter of the book of Acts uh, that Paul was riding uh, down to on the road to Damascus uh, and a great light, a great light shined down upon him. The light was uh, brighter than the noonday sun. And the Bible says that it knocked him off of his horse uh, and uh, the light shined upon him and uh, Christ said to him, uh, Paul, Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou? And uh, he, the voice came saying, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Uh, it is hard for you to kick against uh, the goads, against uh, the pricks. And Paul said, uh, what would you have me to do? And um, Christ told him exactly what he needed to do to go and witness to uh, the Gentiles. And so uh, Paul began to learn more and more, uh, studied more and more, and found himself at a place called Antioch of Caesarea and at the church that was the base of, of the Christians at that time. That's where they were first called Christians. And so uh, Paul is there. Uh, he's ministering there with someone by the name of Barnabas. And the Bible says in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts uh, that as they ministered as they prayed as they ministered to the Lord and prayed and fasted uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit said separate me Barnabas and Saul unto the work that I have called them and so uh, Paul and Barnabas set out on the missionary journey they went to a place called um, uh, per or Cyprus first then they went to Perga then they went to Antioch of Pisidia then they went to a place called Iconium uh, where they ministered God wrought a wonderful work in their lives the Jews are believing, the Gentiles are believing, but how many know again that when God blesses, the enemy will try to mess, amen? And so uh, they, uh, the Jews were buffeted them, bringing all sorts of accusations against, against them, trying to persecute them. And so they found, found themselves uh, at Lystra. And this is where our text, where we find our text here, that they found themselves in Lystra ministering. Praise the Lord. And so we're in Acts chapter 14, verse 8. And uh, Lystra was a village. Uh, Caesar Augustus turned it into a Roman co colony. But what we see here now, uh, we see uh, that there was someone who was a cripple. There was someone who was a cripple. Now, what is a cripple? Saints, what is a cripple? Someone who cannot do what? Someone who cannot walk. Someone who's lame. Uh, the Bible lets us know that this person was lame from their birth, uh, could not walk, uh, and that uh, they never actually walked before. Uh, but as we look at that word cripple, what we begin to understand is that there's not just one type of cripple. There's not just one type of lame because there's physical, the physical cripple, but then there are a lot of people that are crippled in many other ways. There are many people that might be crippled in their ability to walk into their destiny that God has set before them, amen? 
Uh, sometimes people are crippled by people's criticism. People criticize you. Uh, maybe when you're young, someone spoke some negative word into your life, and that followed you all throughout your life, and you never believed that you could do anything all because of that criticism, crippled by people's words. Uh, sometimes people are crippled by even fear, uh, cannot do anything, cannot stand before people, cannot um, use their gifts, use their talents, cannot do anything because of fear, fear of people. And sometimes people are also crippled because of their past. Sometimes it's guilt, condemnation because of something that they did bad in their past and that follows them and weighs upon in their mind and in their spirit so that they cannot not walk now into the destiny that God has for them. Can't walk in their destiny. But how many know that the gospel has the ability to bring healing to the cripple? Amen. The gospel, I'll say it one more time. The gospel has the ability to bring healing to the crippled mind, not just the physically crippled, but also to the crippled mindset, the mindset of failure, the mindset of doubt. When the gospel comes into someone's heart, it has the ability to displace all of those things. And that's why we know that we can do all things through who? Through Christ who strengthens us. Praise God. And so it doesn't matter. The Bible says here uh, that this person, they never walked. They never walked. And I'm so glad that I serve a God that is able to call me to do something that I've never done before. It doesn't matter what I've, it doesn't matter what the challenge is before me. See, sometimes there are things that God wants us to do, and because we've never done it before, sometimes we are afraid. Sometimes we are crippled. Sometimes we can't walk forward because we've never done it before. But I'm here to tell you that God is calling some of you to do something that you've never done before, to do something that you think you cannot do, but God is saying you are correct you cannot do it I'm the one that's going to do it through you and when it's all said and done I'm the one that's going to get the glory amen so God is calling you to do something that you've never done before to an area where you may never have been before to uncharted waters but the Bible says here uh, that they heard the preaching how many know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God so they heard the preaching and the Bible says that Paul saw he was able to perceive uh, that they uh, had the faith that this person that was crippled had the faith uh, to be able to believe how many know that God honors our faith. God honors our faith and it doesn't matter what situation you are in. It doesn't matter if you're crippled by life circumstances. If you feel as though you can't walk forward, if you can just have that mustard seed faith, that will be enough to catapult you forward into your divinely appointed destiny. So we see that they had faith. What is faith? It is the state of believing on someone or something that is reliable. Faith is not just craziness. I just want to believe X, Y, and Z. I just want to believe. Faith is believing something that is reliable. Someone that is reliable. And so the Bible says that he saw that this person had faith uh, and that uh, this person uh, was able to believe God regardless of being in a crippled state. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we see then that the Bible says that Paul commanded him to stand up and he leaped up and he walked around. Now, if we look closely at that word leap, we'll see that it was an instantaneous uh, action that he leaped up immediately. Once and for all, he leaped up. But then the walking around was a continuous action that he was able to do. So what we see here is that God is able to do something in your heart, in your mind, in your life instantaneously that will have continuous effects for the rest of your life. For the re you just missed a good place to say amen. 
Praise God. God is able to do something instantaneously in your heart and in your mind that is able to have continuous effects in your life. But God wants us to stand up from that complacency, stand up from that place of defeat, to stand up and to move forward, not backward. And so as we continue to look in the text, uh, we see now a funny thing happen. So the question then is that as a great miracle happens, what is the human interpretation? interpretation of that great miracle what is the human spin on that great miracle how do we see it in our eyes of clay uh, how do we see what the awesome God is actually doing through these limited eyes and with this limited mind and so we see that the crowds here they acknowledge that a great miracle took place they acknowledged it but they gave the wrong person the credit they in, they concluded that it actually was Paul when it was actually God and so what did they say they said the gods have come down now when they use the term the gods it's like they're using that definite article there so it seems as though they weren't saying uh, a God but they're saying the gods so it seemed as though it was uh, someone as false as they were who they were familiar with so as, as we see, as we read the text, uh, they were talking about Zeus and Hermes, uh, which they were actually familiar with. And time does not allow us to get into the story behind that, that there was a uh, myth about them coming down, Zeus and Hermes coming down before, and they treated certain people good and they treated certain people bad. And so now these folks here, they wanted to make sure uh, that they acknowledge these false gods, that they acknowledge them so that they would be treated good and so now we see in their limited mind in their 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 world in their imagination we see that they are attributing a divine miraculous work they're interpreting that in their own world how many know that sometimes God is at work amongst us God is doing something great amongst us even in our midst in corporate worship or even in our lives outside the four walls of the church but sometimes we misinterpret what God is doing with our limited minds. Sometimes we call it something else when it is actually not that. Sometimes we don't give credit to God for what he's actually doing because of our limited minds. And so we have to be very careful. And this is the reason why we speak about faith because what is faith? Faith is the ability to climb outside the constraints of our limited vision and to be able to say, God, I can't see it all. I don't understand it all. I realize that I'm limited but father I realize there's something that's outside of my own sphere my own understanding and so now I'm extending my faith I may not understand it all but I know that if you said it because you are reliable because you are trustworthy because your word is reliable and heaven and earth will pass away but your word will not pass away I'm going to latch on to your word I'm going to latch on to what you have said even though I may not understand it that's what faith is Faith is climbing outside of your world, of your, 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 your understanding, of your imagination, of everything you know, and saying that, God, I'm going to release my understanding into your uh, realm, which is not limited. That's why we can grasp, we can grab a hold of things uh, that we don't necessarily see. Faith is really uh, a, a title deed, if you will, of the thing that you have a right to. Yes, you, 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 you purchase a house and you, you, you sign an agreement of sale, but you don't have the house yet, uh, but you go to the closing and you sign the papers and you get what they call a title deed. Are you physically in that house yet? Are you standing in that house yet? No, but you have a right to enforce ownership of that house because you have the title deed, the legal right uh, to step into that house and to kick everybody else out. And I'm here to tell somebody today that faith is the title deed for what God has promised you and when God has promised you something when you have the title deed in your hand you have the ability to step into that promise you have the ability to kick the enemy out of that promise and to evict the enemy out of what God has promised you praise God that's faith that's faith 
praise God, hallelujah. Climbing outside of the limits of our understanding, praise God. And so what we see then is that God was at work, but man's image, man's, man's understanding, man's tainted image. We have, as it were, glasses that are darkened so that we can't actually see uh, what we really need to see. And what darkens our, our, our glasses is something called sin. It's something called our fallenness. And we are unable to really understand what God is doing. And that's what was going on here. So they misinterpreted in their corruptness, in their short-sightedness, in their blindedness. They misinterpreted it. And they actually found themselves in the sin of idolatry, of idolatry. But idolatry is happening today, too. It's not just back then. You have in many circles, and I'm not going to call any names. <laughs> you have in many circles, and don't tell me to call any names. Uh, in many circles, you have the situation where people elevate men. They uh, praise men like they are God. They'll give men godlike status. I've seen it happen. They will attribute the works of God to men. They will attribute the miracles of God to men as though people are actually doing it. They will, they will give, again, Superman, God-like status uh, to men and elevate them. They will think that they can't do anything wrong, that whatever they, they do, uh, it must be right, or whatever they say, it has to be right because this is just a powerful man of God. Well, you might be a powerful man of God, but you're not infallible. But you're not infallible. Those are two totally different things. They will prop them up like a false image, like an idol, and practically worship them. It happens many times, and we should be aware of these things. But it's important not to take credit for what God is doing. It's important to tell the true story. It's important to tell the true story of who the hero is. And how many know that I'm not the hero, you're not the hero, we're not the hero. The only hero that we're talking about when we're talking about the gospel is Jesus Christ and him only. Praise God. So don't make man the hero. Don't make man the silver bullet. Don't make man uh, the answer to every issue, every problem. Well, this person can solve it. Every, nobody knows everything about everything. Nobody knows everything about everything. Some people might want you to think that they do, but again, nobody knows everything about. Listen, if you want to know what, ma what man's place is, let me tell you. Man was made from the dust of the earth, and from dust he will return. If you really want to know what man is, what the anthropology of man is, what is man? Uh, man, his heart is desperately wicked. If you really want to know, if you really want to undress it and say, what re should we value man? Should we attribute wonderful things to man? Should we attribute perfection to man? This is what man is. There is none righteous, no, not one. Out of the heart of men comes evils and adulteries and, and wicked works and, and murders. That's the heart of man. That's the heart of man that there is a righteousness is as filthy rags. Let, let's, call, let's call a spade a spade. Let's, let's, let's really talk about what man is. His heart is wicked. His imagination is wicked. Even in, on man's best days, when everybody sees him on his best days, it's still filthiness before God. It does not measure up to God's holiness and God's righteousness. That's what man is. Praise God. And the only reason why we can think anything of ourselves is because of what God does in our lives. When God breathes into our lives and we become a living soul and that which was dead in our lives becomes alive, that's the only time that we can say, okay, something here that's worthwhile is going on. So we have to understand uh, that we ought not to put man up higher than he actually should be. We ought not, listen, man can dress himself up. And when I say man, I'm using that, that general phrase, mankind, that anthropos uh, general phrase of mankind. So it includes every man, woman, boy, girl. At, we, we have to be very careful about propping people up because that's a very dangerous place to be. It's very dangerous place to be. This hero mentality 
this uh, savior mentality, there are many time, many places where people actually attribute that to people. They actually attribute that to sometimes even their leaders. And that I'm just so glad for a church like True Light where our pastor preaches over and over and over again uh, that this is not something that's biblical, that we ought to walk in humility. Amen? Praise God. But we ought to watch out for it. We ought to watch out for it because even as uh, we try to move forward, the hero mentality, the savior mentality, it is very dangerous because it gets in the way of teamwork. It gets, and listen, even in the workplace, they start talking in their understanding, which is not 100%. Even they understand the importance of teamwork. They have a whole uh, uh, computer software that's called Microsoft Teams because they understand the importance of teamwork. But what happens with this hero, Superman, savior mentality is that it gets in the way of the ability to work together as a team and it causes offenses. Amen. Praise God. And so, you know, we got to get away from this. People worship this. You know, sometimes we even have singers that have made it very well. Uh, and we begin now to prop them up and to just really adore them. But guess what? They are human just like you and I. And they have a lot of faults, sometimes more than you and I. So we have to be very careful about, uh, you know, look. You know, a leader is a leader, and a leader in one sense can serve um, as a type of hero, but not a perfect hero, not a perfect model at all. And we have to keep it real because when we uh, allow people to think that we are perfect or that we're some sort of hero, that gets in the way of the gospel because the gospel is very humbling. The gospel lets us know that we are not the hero, that we are full of faults, and it's because of the mercy of God that we can be here. So we trample over all of that when we try to be the hero, when we try to fix every single problem, to work every, every single issue out as though we are the savior. Praise God. That's, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. Um, and so, you know, as we continue to look at this text, let's jump now to uh, the 14th verse and let's see what Paul says, because Paul says Paul actually did what we all need to do. The next time someone, it doesn't matter if you're in church circles or if you're working on a project at work or if you're in your community and you're trying to work together. Listen what Paul did. He ascribes the glory to God. In essence, he was saying it's all God. Uh, Paul's message message was this, uh, because he recognized that this was the enemy's attempt to take credit for the work of God. Uh, it was the enemy's attempt to hijack the work of God, and they recognized this, and so they cried out to them. They cried out, look, you're doing something that is wrong, and they cried out. Listen, I wish we had more people today that could cry out about things that are wrong. Today, you have a lot of people that are on the mountaintop, people that are smiling, people that are rejoicing, but how many people are still crying out about the evil that's going on on the land? How many people are still grabbing a hold of the altars and crying out to the Lord and say, Lord, this is wrong. Look what's going on in our world. Look what's going on in our society. Look at how much compromise is going on even in the church. Lord, I pray that you would just bring change, the ability to cry out before God. You don't see that a lot today, but I'm praying that God would just move in the hearts of his people, that we would be able to cry out once again and say, let's turn our hearts uh, to the Lord. And so we see that, what did they say? They said, we we are men. We're just human beings. We have the same nature as you. And what we're doing is we're preaching the divine message of repentance. We're preaching the gospel. We're preaching about turning away. Turning away from what? Turning away from idolatry. So, so it's important for us to tell the true story. Tell the true story about uh, man's need to repent. Man's need to, what does it mean to repent? It means to turn away. 
it means to turn away. And there's so many things that we need to turn away from today. So many things that we as a society, we as the body of Christ need to turn away from today. How many know that there is a lot of idolatry that's going on in our world today? Amen. There's, a, there's so much idolatry, things that are being, what is idolatry? It's anything you put before God. So you wake up in the morning, and what's the first thing you do? Tell the truth now. If the first thing you do is grab your phone and check social media, we got a problem. If, if you're supposed to be praying, and instead of praying, you can't pray two minutes, but you can, what do they call it again when you watch like a series after series of, of what's it called? B binge, binge. If, you, if you can binge watch all Saturday for like 16 hours, but you can't spend 16 seconds in prayer, you got an idolatry problem. Let's keep it real. You've got an idolatry problem. You can't stay on your knees for two minutes, but you can watch two, three, four, five, six hours of TV. There is a pro Houston, we have a problem. So idolatry, God is, is, is calling his church away from idolatry, away from things that do not please him, away from um, elevating people to a status that they should not uh, be at uh, against uh, having alliances uh, with people uh, that are groups that, that the church has no business having alliances with. God is calling his church to turn away. Just as Paul was preaching the message of the gospel of turning away, God is calling his church to turn away from wicked ways because God wants to bring a healing upon the land but my Bible says in 2nd Chronicles chapter 7 and 14 that if my people who are what who are called by my name will do what humble themselves and pray and what and seek my face and what this is the part that I like and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and bring healing to the land and he's speaking about my people he said if my, he's not saying the world. He's not saying those people that don't know me. He's not saying uh, that the heathen, but he's saying if my people will turn. So God's people have some wicked ways. Oh, I'll say it again. God's people have some wicked ways. Praise God. And God is calling his people to turn from those wicked ways. Yes, we can pray for the healing. Yes, we can pray for the healing of the land and ask God to do this and God to do that. But God is asking us to do something as well. He's asking his church, telling his church, commanding his church to turn from our wicked ways to turn from the works of the flesh, turn from trying to do things in our own power, to turn from the adulteries, to turn from the fornications, to turn from the uncleanness, to turn from the lasciviousness, to turn from the heresies and preaching wrong doctrines, to turn from the hatred, hating one another, secret hatreds against each other, low-grade anger festered against each other. God is saying, turn away from all of that. Turn away from the envyings and jealousies against our brother and our sister and the emulations and trying to outdo one another well let me see if next Sunday I can do a better job than they can turn away from all of that to turn away from the witchcraft to that's a works of the flesh is right there smack in the middle of Galatians chapter 5 to turn away from trying to use supernatural means to control somebody that's not doing what you want them to do that's called witchcraft and God is saying turn away from it God is coming out against it and exposing it in the name of Jesus hallelujah Turn away from wrath, turn away from the seditions, turn away from the strife, turn away from all of that junk, turn away from drunkenness, the things that are controlling you. It may not be a bottle of alcohol, but it might be something else that's trying to control your life, that drunkenness, drunk with power, drunk with titles, drunk with the things that don't please God. How I look in front of people, God is saying, turn away from that. 
Turn away from drunkenness. Turn away from revelings. Turn away from the idolatry. Turn away from variants. Turn away from all of the cliques and all of the separate organizations, separate groups inside the church. Turn away from my way of thinking, my limited way of thinking. Well, it has to go this way or else it's not God. No, it does not. God is much larger than our imagination, much larger than what we could ever ask or think God is able to do. And I'm telling you, when the gospel shows up, the gospel normally shows up in a way that we don't expect. So if all we're thinking in our minds is this is the way that it's always been, and if it doesn't happen that way, then it's not God. I'm telling you, you are on a wrong track and you're gonna miss it. You're gonna miss it because the gospel, as long as it lines up with the word of God, but the methodology of the gospel is you look throughout the book of Acts, it changes, it changes. One time the Jewish people were in the, the temple, next time they're in a synagogue. Next time they're in a proseka right by the river just worshiping. So the methodology and the context changes sometimes, but God is asking us to turn away from our wicked ways and our limited ways of thinking and trying to put God in a box. God is much larger than the small box that we so many times are trying to put him in. If you can imagine something, God's imagination is way beyond what you could ever ask or think. Praise God. Turn away from that. So what was the message? The message was now. Now that I'm turning away from that, what do I turn to? I turn to the living God. That's what Paul's message was. Now, Paul understood the true story, and Paul understood that a miracle, a great work of miracle took place. He understood that he was not the hero, and now he's sending the message to them showing that it is all God. And he's saying, turn away from all of these stupid, dumb idols, as the King James Version puts it. Turn away from all of that. And now you have to turn to the one that is actually alive, not these dead idols, not the mythology that you're embracing. There's so much myths out there right now that are attacking the people of God, that are attacking uh, people. You see them sometimes on the streets. I know that when I dropped David at college, you see some of them lining up at college campuses, trying to preach all sorts of doctrines and all sorts of of myth, but it's important for us to be like Paul and to tell the true story that you turn away from all of those dumb idols and that you need to turn to the living God, the God who is the creator. And if God is the creator, he is the one uh, that has the authority because he is the author and the finisher. That word author, it implies authority and it means God has the authority to say what is right and what is wrong. Only God has the authority to say what is holy and what is not holy. Only God has the authority to say who is righteous and who is not righteous. Only God has the authority to say what is the atonement for sin. You, we cannot determine what the atonement for sin is and say that's not fear. It's God Almighty, the creator. It's the sovereign God. And Paul is saying, turn towards the living God, the creator, the sovereign God. Turn towards the one that is able to do wonderful things in your life, that's able to give you love when you're unlovable and when everybody else is hating you, this God is able to love you. Turn to the one that is able to give you peace with God and the peace of God that passeth all understanding in the moment of your crisis when you feel like you're going down for the last time, this God is able to fill your heart with peace that you don't even understand, that you cannot figure out. This God is able to give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. What is joy? It's something that's deep down in your soul that even when you're going through the most difficult situation, you can still wear a smile. That's the joy of the Lord. It overcomes whatever you are going through. That's the joy of the Lord. It's a mystery to the world, but it's something that we know that comes from the Lord. Turn to the God that is able to provide for you that's able to shepherd you, that's able to lead you into the pastures of peace, 
that's able uh, to anoint you to whatever position he has for you, that is able to serve as your guide, that's able to serve as your compass for righteousness, that is able to be your shield, that is able to be your refuge and your strength and a very present help even in the time of trouble. That's what he's saying. But what are you saying? Because a lot of times, listen, I'm, I'm just through, but a lot of times we can quote these things. But when it comes to our Monday through Saturday experience, the application of these principles is totally different. And we have to remember that there is a difference between God and man. The theologians call it the creator creation distinction. God is the one that deserves the praise. Be very careful, and this is really the heart of the message. Be very, very careful about elevating anyone to godlike status. Sometimes it happens in a very subtle way, especially if you're dealing with people that have been in church all their lives. They can put Bible around it so it looks, it sounds nice. It sounds biblical. But we ought to be like, help us, that's right. We ought to be like the Bereans and have our Bible open and say, wait a minute, is what's going on here? Does it check out with the word of God? And if it doesn't check out with the word of God, I'll give you the best advice that you might be able to get today. Hit the door and run for your lives. Or if, it's, if somebody is giving somebody God-like status, that is against the word of God. And that's something that nobody should tolerate because there is only one God. There is only one God. Amen? Well, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm through. I'm not, I'm not going to be before you long, but, but listen, this, this is so important uh, in our lives today. There is so much junk that's going on right now. So much junk that's going on right now, and so much um, self-centeredness is probably the best word that I can find that's going on in the ministry. And we ought to be very careful as we turn on the TV, as we look at the, or listen to the radio, uh, as we're exposed to different uh, ministries, we ought to have our armor on because there's a lot of things going on out there in the name of Christ that has nothing to do with the gospel. Amen. Praise God. Let's, let's bow our heads.